The future is here. A super-powered tram packed with supercharged capacitors capable of traveling 10 kilometers on only 10 seconds of charge. From the back streets to a high-tech processing plant comes an incredible innovation that could transform commercial air travel. All this from an emerging innovative powerhouse. This is China. And we are just at the beginning. This is the future, right? I'm Josh Klein. I spend my life unpacking and hacking ideas, systems, networks, and future technologies. I've worked with some of the biggest names in the tech industry. And in my world, a good hack is a smart solution to a problem. That's incredible. Yeah, we are under construction. This is a real solution that you're rolling out throughout yeah, China. That's right. And hackers are the innovators that create them. 5,000 years of history. And it's the kind of solution that only China can provide. That's why I've come here. The Chinese are harnessing their immense capacity to take on some of the world's toughest problems. So I'm traveling thousands of kilometers to uncover some of China's smartest minds, their unique innovations, and join forces with a panel of experts. That's leading edge, right? That's leading edge that nobody else in the world can do. An innovation like this, and China could absolutely use it. People have consistently underestimated the demand for connectivity. You can position this to really take off. To discover just how smart China really is. In this episode, I search out innovations that could radically solve the world's transport problems. I've just spent the last two hours in bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic, going nowhere. The reason that I've traveled halfway around the world to do this is that traffic congestion is a big, gnarly problem, one that no one has even come close to solving yet. In my mind, if anyone can solve it, it'll be China, who suffers from this worse than almost anywhere else I've been. And if they can do it, maybe they can fix it for the rest of us. All right, we're going nowhere fast. I'm actually just going to walk it. With almost 240 million vehicles and more than seven times the number of drivers that there were just a decade ago, it's no wonder China's traffic infrastructure is feeling the pressure. This kind of traffic congestion is a daily occurrence. It's just part of the price that they're paying for their booming economic success. The flip side of this huge financial growth is there's the potential to invest in gridlock solutions, which is why I've been lured to Guangzhou. Here at the base of the 600-meter-high Canton Tower is a revolutionary new super tram system. Its creators believe it can make a huge dent in the gridlock dilemma by enticing people to make the shift from car to futuristic clean green commuter transport. There's no power lines above or below the ground. It's quick and efficient, and they tell me that its power system is simply stunning. Here's what I love about this technology. It's a simple solution that's an ideal fit for the problem. And there's certainly plenty of commuters being enticed on board, while I've been seduced by the chance to get up close and personal with this incredibly smart Chinese invention. I've been promised the inside scoop by the world's largest train builder, CRRC. The company's vice chief engineer, Ying Yang, is carrying on the vision of his former boss to realize this tech, an innovation he believes will go some way to solving gridlock and the downstream effects of pollution. We can do our best to reduce the air pollution and the energy consumption and give the city a very clean sky, you see. First stop, a test drive of the original model. This is the ARB train we use as a prototype to test our SuperCab flash charging technology. So this is the very first one ever? Yeah, yeah. And it's that super cap flash charging tech that's triggered my interest. There's no overhead lines in this pimped out tram as it carries its super capacitor power pack on its back. Super capacitors are like a battery, except they store, discharge, and recharge huge amounts of power extremely quickly. So this is where everything charges. Yeah, when the train reaching this platform, this 
current connector shoes will automatically activate and the contact this power. And then 1,800 amp current <laughs> to this. That's a lot of juice. Effect. Yeah. And uh, fully charge this shoe cat within 30 seconds. You charge all your capacitors 100% within 30 seconds. Within 30 seconds. This prototype has its charging shoe on the side of the tram, while the latest model has a roof full of supercapacitors that get charged at a super fast rate via a roof charging mechanism. During normal operation, trams only need to stop for around 10 seconds to let passengers on and off, charge its supercapacitors, and head to the next platform and charging station. Wow, all right, that's a lot of capacitors. How many, how many is in here? Uh, in this case, we have more than 600, but uh, we have put in different modules. Yeah. We have 43 modules. So this is 43 capacitors? No, no, it, uh, each module has 16 super capacitors. And they're just chained together? Yeah, they're uh, connecting in series, you can see. It's so clean. It's such a simple, uh. elegant design. Uh. Another advantage is that we don't need to do any uh, maintenance to it. Really? Yeah. All you do is wait until it finally wears out and then replace it. Yeah. After 10 years. You After replace. 10 years. So they're fast to charge, extremely powerful, and have a long lifespan. But when you're dealing with the huge amount of energy it takes to drive a tram, safety is also key to supercapacitor design. They're fireproof, crush, and shock resistant, because even when fully charged, the carbon they contain is totally inert. The supercapacitor's magic also permits the trams to perform a clever energy-saving trick. So what's this? Oh, this shows the energy level stored on the supercapacitor. Now it's 84% uh, 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 energy stored. But the electricity went up when you were braking. Yeah, it goes up. In most standard braking systems, the kinetic energy of a vehicle in motion is converted into heat via friction as it slows the vehicle down. These trams use their electric motors to brake and convert the kinetic energy while braking into electrical energy that's stored and used to power the tram. So that's got to be huge savings. Compared with conventional, you see, uh, train with uh, criteria, we are 30 percent uh, less energy consumption. You use 30 percent less? Yeah. A third less? Yeah. That's an enormous savings. And here's the secret to this supercharged technology. Inside each supercapacitor is a whole bunch of electrical reactions. But it's this activated carbon that magically increases the surface area of the electrode plates to be thousands of times larger than a standard capacitor all packed inside a casing barely the size of a milk carton. And with a stack of these on board the tram, there's no need for unsightly overhead wires. For landscape, they have good landscape. That's another point of the, the technology you see. Of course, in a, in a normal tram system, you've got to have electrical wires running all along the entire track. Yeah. But with this, all you have to do is lay the track itself, uh -huh. and then the tram carries all the power with it. Uh -huh. So I imagine it's also much safer, because you're not running electricity along miles and miles. Oh, yeah. In downtown area, we have a lot of pipe. Water yeah. pipe, gas pipe, mm -hmm. in rainy season, and uh, cause the erosion of the pipe buried uh, underground. Of course, an electrolytic reaction. So. Oh, you know, I'd never thought of that, but it's true. I mean, if you're running an electrical current along miles of track, uh -huh. some of that's going to leak out into the soil. Yeah. And like you said, especially when it's raining, then that's going to go down and reach yeah, all yeah. the other pipes, yeah, gas yeah. pipes, which I don't really like the idea of so electrical currents. So reduce the lifetime of this pipe. Right. So then it causes all those pipes to corrode and you have to replace them again. Yeah, so, yeah. The, so the ancillary, the secondary costs must be enormous. of this entire system. I didn't realize that there were so many ancillary costs like um, electricity leaking into the ground in a standard design, eroding pipes, um, the, the savings that the regenerative braking produces, uh, the amount of electricity and the speed with which that they can get it into the capacitors. The system overall is so vastly superior to what we have right now and it's much safer and honestly it's much more environmentally friendly. It's pretty awesome. But it's one thing to have a unique innovation, and quite another to roll it out at scale. 
Here to provide a critique is traffic engineer Professor Won Jing Ma from Tongji University and Dr. Mariella Alfonso, a specialist in urban design and planning. So this seems like a solution tailor-made for China. It scales well, has a nice ecological impact, it's relatively inexpensive, especially over the lifetime of the system. But I've got to believe there's complexities when you start implementing something like this inside something as large as the mega cities in China. What am I missing? What are you missing? Well, China, China is very used to making these kinds of infrastructure efforts. I mean, they've been ultra successful. I think the the benefit of this particular technology is that uh, second and third tier cities who don't have subways can actually use these um, as a less, co you know, more cost effective mm -hmm. way to move people. Because at, at the moment, there's pretty much you either walk or you drive, which means that mostly you drive because these cities are still quite large, even mm -hmm. though they're considered small cities mm -hmm. by Chinese mm -hmm. standards. So I think that it would be a huge uh, positive impact on reducing energy and, and pollution in these cities. But the big question is, can we grow this technology to solve the problems of cars, all the traffic and the pollution that come with them? It's a huge problem for China and a huge problem for the world. Coming up, China's innovators set out to solve one of the biggest environmental hazards on the planet. Gridlock and pollution. The biggest issues facing the megacities of the world, and China is no exception. This state-of-the-art supercapacitor-powered tram may have the potential to entice commuters out of their vehicles and into clean, green, futuristic commuter transport. So its creator, Chinese company CRRC has gone from prototype to delivering its first commercially run tram in the city of Guangzhou. I really do think that supercapacitors are an amazing technology, but how easily are they going to slot into China's existing transportation infrastructure? And is this really a global solution? Well,不认为这种技术是只为中国的，呃，因为有很多城市、很多国家的这个情况，比如说大量的这个人口，其实不仅仅是中国，呃，很多城市都是这样。即便在七十一个电车在欧洲，呃，更加的普及。其实呃
uh, just uh, after a simple conversation. Bong Wedding eBay Cafe. So how does it work? Well, my request for piping hot coffee has been sent through Sogo's super fast network. That data connects to my unique user details and secure payment information. Checks my preferences, searches its database to find the closest registered coffee company, sends me an electronic confirmation receipt, and voila, it finally fires me a text alert when it's had one delivered to the office. More than that, it's also capable of learning exactly how you like your coffee. So this is what's going on in the back end then? Yeah. How's it work? We have a clear pictures of latest trends and users' habits in terms of taste, uh, consumption abilities, and uh, history orders. And by doing so, we can predict users' need and provide them their suitable service. And with deep learning, our whole system is becoming smarter and more accurate. So it learns all the time? Yeah. Cool. Sogo's advanced search and voice recognition technology is at the heart of how this app can deliver a product so fast. Hakuitanfangi 有了這種目的之後,再跟我背後已經構建了大量的這個服務的數據庫能夠去做自動的這種匹配。That combined with key connections between retail outlets, third-party apps, payment accounts, and the search technology to manage the user's preferences makes for a highly personalized and efficient service. And it's not just coffee this app can deliver. There's a massive range of products and services on offer. So the idea is that once you're plugged in, these kinds of apps act as a sort of virtualized assistant, anticipating what you need and bringing it to you where and when you need it. I'm thinking Peruvian dinner and maybe a neck massage. Neck massage. Now I'm going to have to work on my Chinese. Which I'll need as I'm heading to the back streets to unearth some very cool tech that turns sludge into liquid gold that can fuel a jet engine. I'm here in Beijing. It's gotten so bad that one of the premiers has declared war on pollution, and it started to shut down some of the coal plants. The problem is that pollution doesn't just come from cars and coal plants. There's bigger engines involved. Chinese scientists are joining with experts from around the world in an attempt to transform one of the biggest environmental hazards on the planet, air travel and the burning of aviation fuel. Here at Sinopec, one of China's largest petroleum companies, a team of experts are developing state-of-the-art aviation fuel. So you're manipulating it at a molecular level, so you can yes. change how the fuel actually behaves. Yes, uh, it will affect the, the fuel's performance. Professor Guangtong Xu is an expert on petroleum analysis. He's joined by Ai Guozheng, a specialist in refinery catalysts, and Dr. Long, the man driving the research and vision. We do need to transform from the biomass to the alternative fuel. It's got the bright future, I think. In the future, the traditional soil energy consumed because it is not sustainable. Along with his development team, Dr. Long is hoping to radically change the chemical structure of aviation fuel to be cleaner and greener. To achieve that, they're working with structures smaller than the wavelength of light. This electron microscope is able to see into matter only a few nanometers across. This machine is a PM. That means it's a transmission electron microscope. And the very high energy is the electric beam come from here and get the very high speed struck the simple at this position. OK, so, so it, that's so, a picture. OK, so it's shooting an extremely powerful, extremely focused beam of electrons. Yes. Super small, you know, molecular level. Yeah. Shooting it through there, and then you're able to get a view of it. And 
And how high resolution is this? How small is this? Yeah, is yeah. it 20, yes. 20, it's nanometers? 20 nanometers? 20 yeah. nanometers. Yes, so. this is uh, 5 nanometers. To put that in context, a strand of human hair is about 40 to 60,000 nanometers thick, while a strand of human DNA is around 2.5 nanometers. In fact, if you want to get this kind of detailed information, you only, maybe you only can use the PM instrument. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. This instrument is uh, very important for getting this kind of information. Right, yeah. right. Different kind of the magnetic the lens made the beam bigger, bigger, bigger. So that, you can wow. see the very detailed information. Science is awesome. Yes. This level of magnification allows the scientists to manipulate its structure in an attempt to satisfy the sustainability needs of the aviation industry. A key component of that development process is the chemical catalyst. From a special catalyst design, we can control a reaction fuels. Oh, so does, does that affect the fuel? How the fuel actually behaves? Yes, uh, and can control the distribution of the uh, in molecular levels for different um, components. So you're manipulating it at a molecular level to optimize performance of the catalyst. And what's the end result of that? Does it make the fuel more efficient? Yeah. Yes, uh, it will affect the, the fuel's performance. And Cinepec are not only fine-tuning their existing fuel products in the lab, but they've gone a step further into the future. They're transforming a backstreet, black-market cooking oil economy into a highly prized commodity, aviation biofuel. And it's down here on the streets that this incredible process begins. OK, check this out. Whoa. That, OK, for what? That's really gross. That's cooking oil, originally. But a lot of legitimate restaurants will dump this stuff out. Then black marketeers pull it out of the gutter. They clean it up until you can't tell where it came from. It's disgusting, and a practice that the Chinese government has cracked down on. But the Sinopec processing plant is transforming this black market oil into high-grade jet fuel to move China's aviation industry into a clean, green future. What they do is they take this oil, which is the same stuff, it's just that they filtered out the solids, but believe me, it's still really disgusting. And they pour it in here. Where this is about to be totally transformed. All right. Oof. Yep, that's not right. Oh! That scared me. How about you? Just a little bit. Oof. The process of transforming waste cooking oil into a biofuel is relatively simple, but creating aviation biofuel is something else entirely. It has to power a commercial jet engine flying at over 3,000 meters high. So what exactly do you do to the oil to transform it into a fuel? First, we don't need the oxygen, so we need to remove it. And then the burn in the aircraft engine, it needs a smaller molecular size. So we need to crack the oil molecule into a smaller molecule. And then the, because the, the working conditions in the in aircraft, the, the temperature is quite low, so we need to reduce the, the freezing point. After some complex handling at the plant, unique chemicals are added to prevent ice buildup and corrosion, while also keeping the fuel from gumming up the system. After years of R&D, Cinepec now have a fuel that's taken them into China's history books. I'm on a quest in search of Chinese scientists, entrepreneurs, and innovators. My journey has led me to the Cinepec Changping Labs, where this petroleum and chemical giant has set itself the goal of creating futuristic fuel turning discarded toxic cooking oils and animal fats into state-of-the-art biojet fuel. This modern-day alchemy hasn't come easy. It's required big thinking at a molecular level. Here's what's beautiful about this. 
We've transformed toxic sludge, junk oil, out of the gutter into this extremely powerful jet fuel. Don't buy it? Check this out. Whoa. Yeah, that's got some juice. Check that out. That's some power right there. That is hot. Enough power to change Chinese history. On March 21st, 2015, China's first cooking oil-fueled flight took off from Shanghai's Hongqiao Airport. A Boeing 737 jet using a 50-50 mix of conventional jet fuel and biofuel. Tackling a major environmental issue and solving a public health concern all at the same time. But what do my specialists think? Is this really grease to gold, or just a flash in the pan kind of concept? I think this is especially important for the development of the invention, because by 2020, there is more than 30% of the aircraft will be from this fuel. So, this invention is not only going to solve the problem of wasteful fuel use, but also to make it more efficient and more efficient. 那么另外呢，其实也是为这个、呃、航空为这个燃油提供了一个非常重要的原料。那么因此，我觉得这是一个非常有意思也是非常有意义的发明。Me as a Westerner, I absolutely love the street food that really brings people to China. You know? So I think to get rid of the negative connotation by using this gutter oil, getting rid of the black market, using it for something good, I think it's all around a great solution. A solution that Sinopec are continuing to evolve as they attempt to reduce China's carbon footprint. The question is, how fast can they produce the volume the airline industry really needs to have an impact? Back on the city streets, roads are still congested, and like the evolution of biofuel, necessity here too may become the mother of invention. Well, it's certainly true that many cities around the world have bad traffic. China's got it worse than most. In fact, there's more drivers in China than the U.S. has people. But equally, there's a growing surge of innovators desperate to turn this around. I've been led to a Chinese company that believes it has a solution for short-range commuter travel with a super green tech called Ninebot. I'm here to get the lowdown from Lu Feng Gao, the founder and CEO of Ninebot, the world's largest company in short-range transportation. Joining Gao is engineer Li Pu, vice president of robotics. So I've been stuck in traffic all day. It's taken a long time to get here, and I hear that you might have an answer. What's a Ninebot? Ninebot? That's Ninebot. Ninebot is a very cool portable transportation device that weighs in under 13 kilos. It can travel up to 35 kilometers on a single charge. And has a top speed of 22 kilometers an hour, perfect for short-range commutes. That, so this thing goes really fast. Sure, yeah. that's extremely nimble. It's a short-range mode. It's, uh, it's very fast. 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 One thing that's a mystery to me is how the thing stays upright. How how does this thing balance itself? It's called self-balancing technology. So basically, there's a gyroscope installed in the system, and I can show you um, with this pencil. So basically, the gyroscope will sense the tilt and the movements of the body of the vehicle. And if there is a tilt or angle, the wheel will go forward to compensate it. So it's doing very slight movement that cannot really see, but it's always balancing itself. Okay, so as you're leaning forward, it's trying to move itself forward so that you're balanced. Exactly. So you're kind of passive aggressively forcing it to move along to keep exactly. a balance. Right. All right, I know a few relationships like that. Okay. <laughs> Where is this heading next? Because what I'm really keen on is to see this have an impact on traffic. And if everybody's going to be using this, it has to be easy to use. It has to be light to carry around. It has to last for a long time. Yes, we're working very hard on enhancing the product. So we're going to use new materials to reduce the weight, and also we're going to use new battery technologies to 
make the vehicle travel faster and also goes further. And also uh, trying to get the vehicle more safe, people to drive. What's going to make it more safe? Because honestly, you're standing on a wheel. That's a little dodgy just to begin with. In some cases, um, the vehicle has to slow down by itself so that you're not going too fast. It will think about safety for you, actually. So it'll think about safety in advance? Exactly. So I can be as reckless as I want to be and it'll keep me from crashing? Don't make, don't make promises you can't keep. <laughs> OK, OK. I'm also thinking about uh, ways of making the vehicle to go somewhere you want it to go, creating some kind of robot system. Really? So the, the nine bot will help make sure I go where I'm supposed to go? Exactly. With ongoing innovations, it feels like this uber cool unicycle is on the cusp of grabbing some real traction. Coming up, speech recognition is at the dawn of a new era. That's amazing. That's incredible. Mix state-of-the-art self-balancing technology with a super efficient power source, and you have an uber cool 21st century Chinese innovation guaranteed to keep young Chinese urbanites on the move. But its creators aren't resting on their unicycle laurels. The company also has a range of two-wheel devices and recently acquired U.S. rival Segway. It's amazingly intuitive. I and mean, I've been riding this thing for five minutes, and it really just feels like, oh, yeah. You, you lean back, you go back, you lean forward, you lean forward, to the left, you go around. It's easy to use. Yeah, it's kind of like riding a bike once you get the knack for it. Is that going to solve China's traffic problems? I don't know. It's certainly going to make a difference in the daily commute. So what are all these different models? What, what do each of these do? This is a daily commute model. So like going to the office, doing the shopping, that kind of thing? Exactly. And this is a uh, knee control version of the daily commute. So you can actually drive it with your knees? Yes. Set your hands up free. Uh, actually, I guess that makes sense, because these are gyroscopically controlled. So you could as well use your knees as you could your hands. I guess the only reason this thing has handles is that it Feels safer. First, it feels safer, and also um, to give you the screen so that you can see some of the parameters or metrics that you're running. And then this one, I guess, is for police. So now it's evolving from really short term to average daily commute, and then on to the special services. Yes. And the last one at the end, what's with that? It's got giant, big, knobby tires. That's for off-road use. Off-road? You can take these yeah. things off-road? Exactly. It has a nodular wheel and has a nodular motor. Wow. This is a platform that's designed for many different circumstances, many different kinds of use. This isn't just a single-use scenario. It's a general-purpose tool. Yes. Nice. With an innovative R&D team and the release of some exciting new GPS and sensor technology, the pickup of these short commute vehicles is starting to gain some serious traction. There's every chance China's congestion problems may be one of the catalysts that's fueling the growth. What's the future of Ninebot? Ninebot, Ninebot so there's a bunch of new tech that will help entice young buyers onto any number of nine bots. But does it really have the potential to make a difference to congestion issues? So for me, this is a lot of fun. It's enjoyable, it's entertaining. But is it actually going to have an impact on traffic? So the Ninebot gets a vote of confidence, and along with growing sales, it may start to be part of the solution for some urban environments. My ongoing hunt for groundbreaking technology that'll keep China on the move 
has led me to this man, Su Wei, deputy president of research at China's number one speech recognition company, iFlyTech. Su Wei is a bona fide genius, a heavyweight in the global speech synthesis arena. Su Wei believes software is at the dawn of a new era, an age beyond simple Siri-like voice commands into the evolution of meaningful conversation with robots. The ultimate goal of our research is want to have some cognition ability so that it can understand what is your meaning of your sentence. The evolution of speech recognition has seen vehicles fitted with technology to keep Chinese drivers' hands on the wheel and on the move. Can we get GPS on this? While vehicle voice communication isn't groundbreaking, iFlyTech's accuracy level of over 95% are and have them leading the field. What about a little, little music? Oh, yeah. You didn't like that song? Oh, uh, yep, that's how it is. What about sending messages? Can you do that? Of course. I think she's calling her boyfriend. It's not looking good. But it's not just vehicles that are becoming hands-free with this tech. The voice recognition software is also keeping us hands-free and on the move in the smart homes of the future. So this system is that you can use to control your TV and via voice, just like something like Siri, but used to control the, the TV. Okay. Oh, you can see that. Yeah. You see it's changed to CCTV channel uh, 13. Yeah. Hang on a second. Hang on a second. Yeah. I, had, I had a thought. Yeah. You've done this entire system yeah. on Mandarin. Yeah. Right. Which has how many characters in it? I think more than 10,000 characters. More than 10,000. And it's a tonal language on top of it. Right. I'm used to English, which is a relatively simple language. That must I don't be... think so. <laughs> no, well, okay, okay, for you, maybe not. But compared to Mandarin, you must have had a much harder time programming this. Yeah. Most of the guys think that there's much more difference between, chi between Mandarin and English, especially for speech recognition. But actually, we do that without knowing the information of the language. We only need to know the transcriptions of the uh, voice, voice samples, and then we make the system to learn from the data automatically. Oh, so you're not yeah. trying to teach the computer to understand language the way that we do. Right, you're trying right, to teach it yeah. to understand it right. the most effective way it can. Right. So you only use the maths. You're yeah, not right, worried right. about whether it's German or English yeah, or right, anything else. Right. We use the uh, statistical learning method to train, a, to train a model, so we need to collect huge amount of data to that, especially uh, the real data from the real environment. And that environment includes over 100 million users, something its competitors, even those in the US, can't match. China's largest voice recognition software developer, iFlyTech, is keeping China on the move with simple, hands-free voice communication. Their network currently has over 100 million users, processing huge volumes of speech data daily that it analyzes to teach its voice recognition system. They may have the same core technology as US competitors like Google or Nuance, but to my mind, it's the voice cloud technology and the massive quantity of dynamic data it generates that gives iFlyTech its edge. They also made a key strategic decision that's keeping their tech moving forward at an incredible pace. Since September 2015, the company has put its core technology on the iFlyTech open platform, and now 80,000 apps have been developed. That means one thing. In the near future, we should see a dizzying array of new apps, all leveraging the company's technology to connect people to their devices and each other in some exciting new ways. One such application is bringing the robotic imaginings of the 21st century a step closer to being science fact. 
the same way that you can control the TV or right. the air conditioner or anything else. But where is it going from here? The ultimate goal of our research is we want to have some cognition uh, ability so that it can understand what is your meaning of your sentence, not just the command that you want them to do. So that is our next target. Now we have found a new way to make the machine to understand the meaning of the words. And we have found that the meaning of the word is very similar to the words surrounding them. So, for example, we can make a, make a similarity between two words by the surrounding words. So it's the same approach you were talking about earlier. Rather than teaching the computer what the meaning of the word river or what the meaning of the word sea is, instead you're statistically saying often, in a sentence, the word river is used in a similar way similar to the ways. word C, right. which means that you can then use all the computational power that you have, the massive amount of data that you've right, gathered right, right. for the computer to learn for itself. Using iFlyTech's statistical language learning system, robots will be able to comprehend complex sentences and the nuances of language rather than just simple instructions. Which means that all of a sudden you can start to program right. the ability that, to understand. That means that the meaning is just a continuous uh, representation in the dance in a very high dimensional space. If I understand you correctly, we've got a model yeah. to move towards enabling robots yeah. to understand what we mean and take action. Right. I mean, personally, I just want one that can bring me a beer, but if it knows why, all the better. Maybe one day, machines will engage in meaningful two way conversations and use their incredible big data and processing power to ultimately solve traffic congestion, and keep the smart planet of the future on the move. Like all the innovations I've discovered, they'll each no doubt play their part in solving large-scale transport problems. In a country as diverse and complex as this, there's never any shortage of problems or potential solutions. An extensive rollout of supercharged trams could well entice hundreds of thousands of Chinese to abandon their vehicles in the cities and venture into the future of short-range commuter transport. And while commercial airlines are one of the biggest environmental hazards on the planet, biofuel production may turn that on its head. If Ninebot's short-range transportation devices can continue their strong uptake, they too will play their part. Either way, I'm convinced that China will continue to stir its innovators to keep the world on the move and bring a future full of possibilities, flowing traffic, and blue skies. And the rapid development we've seen today is only the beginning of a new, smart China.